Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Mark Jeftovic, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Hey, Robert. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, man. Uh, you are the second guest in our Miami studio, so it is my honor. <laughs> we're not completely put together here yet, but we're coming along. Um, just by way of quick introduction, you are... The Bitcoin capitalist on Twitter. Um, and we're going to talk about some things that you have written today. I was going to talk about the nature of money, Bitcoin, talk a little bit about CBDCs, uh, maybe some of your personal story as well. So before we jump into all of that, maybe it would be useful to have just a little bit about you, your personal journey, your career path, and how you ended up as the Bitcoin capitalist. Sure. I'll try to keep it like, you know, the Reader's Digest version. But uh, my main gig is I run a web hosting DNS domain company out of Toronto called EasyDNS.com. Co-founded it with a couple of partners in late 90s, 98, uh, you know, came up uh, on the internet, like in the mid 90s. I thought I was headed for a life of doing COBOL maintenance code. And then one day I picked up a a Mondo 2000 magazine on my way to school and my whole life changed in an instant. And I became, uh, uh, like it just, I saw the internet was coming. It was going to be big. It was going to change the whole world. And I just knew I wanted in, uh, you know, long story short, started easy DNS, uh, bought out my partners in 05, still been running the company ever since completely bootstrapped. But along the way, um, I started to learn about economics and finance, like through the dot-com boom and bust and that sort of thing and started studying Austrian school economics and like, why did the dot-com bust happen? And uh, in the early aughts came across something called e-gold, digital gold mm -hmm. currencies. And I thought this, this could be um, a bit of a game changer because what I was realizing I mean, we can talk about it a bit more, but I was just realizing that this whole idea of fiat money was creating problems, mm. created perverse incentives. But the digital gold currency experiment failed. Ultimately, e-gold, uh, PC Unix, all of those went down the tubes. Uh, and I just kept on with my business and running, you know, running the shop and, and just reading more about economics. And I kind of became a bit of a finance junkie. Uh, and then 
relatively late in the game, 2013, I came across Bitcoin. Hmm. And uh, it was instant pattern recognition. It was like eagle failed, but this might not. This might actually work. Um, you know, fell in love with it instantly. Within you know 30 days of coming across it, I was not only listening to every episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. I became one of their sponsors, their first hmm. non-Bitcoin sponsor, and possibly the longest one. Uh, and then within 30 days after that. Easy DNS was taking Bitcoin as a payment method. Hmm. We've been doing it ever since, stacking it ever since. And, uh, you know, now what's, what's happened in the last few years when the lockdowns hit under the pandemic, I kind of went a little crazy. So hmm. this is sort of a massive fast forward. And um, to uh, my wife said, you've got to do something to stay sane because <laughs> I was just so angry at the lockdowns and how crazy the whole situation was. So I just thought I would just double down on my investing game and just study micro caps and nano caps because that's where I thought I would get alpha. And I kept, and I came up as a value investor. Mm -hmm. like I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the rational way for me to approach it. And so I kept finding you know, what the value investors call, you know, Ben Graham style net nets. Mm -hmm. you know, this is like around 2020, 2021. I'm finding these companies that are trading for less than net asset value. And they turned out to be like Bitcoin and crypto companies. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this thinking cryptos are at all time highs. And at this point I am sort of lumping all the digital assets in one, in one bucket at mm -hmm. the time I've since differentiated a lot, but so, Bitcoin's at all-time highs. Cryptos are at all-time highs. These stocks are trading in the toilet. There's mm -hmm. a massive asymmetry here. So I started writing like little research reports on these companies. You know, one of them was Fortress Technologies, which is Marty mm -hmm. Bent's Cathedra yeah. Mining now. Uh, I said, you know, this company is trading for whatever, you know, 20 cents at the time, and it's got 24 cents in Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is going up. Mm -hmm. So that turned into you know, the Bitcoin capitalist newsletter, which mm. I, you know, have going now, uh, sort of launched under the lockdowns, bomb thrower media around it. So bombthrower.com and then the Bitcoin capitalist. And then, you know, my main thing is easy DNS. Mm. Super cool. What, so when you, you were first of all, we're looking at digital money projects prior to Bitcoin, you mentioned eGold. Yeah. What was it about Bitcoin that made you think that it had a possibility of succeeding where others had failed? It was the decentralization aspect. Because mm. the problem with eGold, first off, I thought eGold had a governance problem because there was a lot of scammers that was sort of crowding out the legitimate usage of it, which is, an, you know, we've heard this from the Liz Warren crew and stuff about Bitcoin, but we know that that's not true when we just look at the numbers now. But there was this centralization aspect to it as well. So when it finally came time for the FBI to close a few major accounts on Eagle, the whole thing went down and that was the end of it. And mm. all of these digital gold currencies were all centralized. They were all mm. entities. Whereas Bitcoin, that was the big thing that like hit me right off the bat is like, this thing is an open source piece of software published on GitHub or mm -hmm. Bitcoin.org. Mm -hmm. Like nobody controls this thing. And it's total pure market adaptation. Mm -hmm. And that's what really impressed me about it is like, this is 100% market force in action. Mm -hmm. And it just kept gaining traction. Yeah. 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 And it keeps gaining traction. Yeah. You also mentioned that you originally lumped crypto and Bitcoin all into one bucket, but then over time you started to uh, distinguish between the two. Was decentralization also the point of discernment between the two for yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I, I started, I mean, the, the newsletter was originally called The Crypto Capitalist, and I launched it with that uh, Crypto Capitalist Manifesto. But, uh, and, and I just loved the riff on, you know, at the time it was like, unfashionable to be a capitalist. So I like the, <laughs> the double entendre of the word crypto, crypto capitalist. But then during the last cycle, when all the, all the shenanigans started coming out with FTX and 3AC and Terra Luna, and I realized this, these things are not central, these things are not decentralized. And the big one for me, the big shift was 
um, Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you briefly, I have a soft spot for the Ethereum name service project because Mm -hmm. my main business is a DNS company. Mm -hmm. And I've always been pining for like a DNS layer Mm -hmm. on Bitcoin, on these decentralized Mm -hmm. ecosystems. And so we were involved with the Ethereum name service early on. And so I had this soft spot for Ethereum. I went to London to the first working group of the ENS working group in 2017. And like these guys, you know, they're well down the path to doing this decentralized naming protocol Mm -hmm. because I've always had this, this, um, did a lot of work about deplatforming and cancel culture and that sort of thing. Mm. But then when they switched from proof of work to proof of stake, I realized this whole thing is centralized. Yeah. This entire thing has a single point of failure. That failure is Vitalik Buterin. What yeah. he wants, he gets. Yeah. This is not a decentralized project. Mm-hmm. The only decentralized project out there is Bitcoin. Yeah. Unless, I mean, maybe Monero, but it's an infinite supply. Yeah. So- the only decentralized project with a hard cap is Bitcoin. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Yeah, and it's, you know, we use the word like it's a binary, centralized or decentralized. Yeah. I would say it's much more like most things in life. It's a continuum. Mm -hmm. However, I think Bitcoin's the only one that has decidedly crossed the threshold, right? It's, we had the block size wars of 2017. There's a lot of battle scars uh, on Bitcoin that other projects simply don't have. If anything, other projects have um, proof points showing that they're centralized, right? Like the Ethereum fork and the Dow scandal, et cetera, et cetera. So that, I mean, this, if anyone like, it's very common for people to come into Bitcoin, get excited about Bitcoin, and then get excited about all these other shit coins, which are all non-Bitcoin cryptos, as if they were as good as Bitcoin. But this is the key point to understand is like dig into this word, decentralization. Um, and it, it will really, I think, just unmask the truth that it's basically Bitcoin is the only thing that matters the rest of these projects are at worst scams and at best uh, venture capital. If you, you know, kind of subjected a little to no due diligence, if you want to use that term. I mean, I look at it like Bitcoin is the TCP IP of non-state anti-fiat money. Exactly. And everything else is like, you know, Microsoft. A startup. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? And some, yeah. some are good, you know, some might be a good investment. Some might be okay projects, but they are not decentralized. They are not money. Yes. They're applications. That's right. So. The other framing I like to think about is even if you combined all of the 30,000 some odd shit coins that are out there and just assumed that they all satisfied all of their technical challenges, right? They, mm-hmm. they created all of the, the achieved all the technical goals that they set out for themselves and achieved full addressable market for all of the projects. If you put all of that together in terms of total addressable market, it's probably less than 20% of Bitcoin's total addressable market. Yeah. And Bitcoin doesn't need to do anything new really, other than just continue to maintain a hard cap of 21 million and churn out a new block approximately every 10 minutes. And it, it will, in theory, succeed in taking that market share that is about five times the combined market share of all these 30,000 shit coins. Yeah. So the risk reward is just so disproportionately in favor of Bitcoin. 
it's also what is the addressable market of Bitcoin? Yeah. I mean, in my mind, I look at the bond market. Mm-hmm. Like to me, that's Bitcoin's addressable market. You know, mm-hmm. because bonds have come to be called, you know, return free risk. And they yeah. used to be risk free return, yeah. right? And so how much are the bonds? The bonds are like anywhere between 150 to 300 trillion, yeah. depending on what you want to count in them. That's Bitcoin's addressable market, not to mention everything else. But yeah. let's just start there. Yeah. What's Filecoin's addressable market? It's right. whatever NetApp is. Yeah. Right. And so that it's almost not even an Apple to oranges comparison. It's like they're trying to accomplish different things. So don't even think of these other challengers or shit coins or cryptos as money or even attempting to be money. That's right. It's just, it's a, it's a software program. It's a SaaS. It's an application. It's whatever. Yeah. That's another useful framing is that all these shit coins are startup businesses. Effectively businesses are basically applications of money. Yeah. Bitcoin's competing to be global money. money, right? Yeah. It's not an application of anything. It is the the yeah. primary application it's, layer, that which upholds all applications. Yeah. Um, not just software applications, but businesses in general, right? Like you may have noticed your household runs on money, your church, your business, <laughs> like everything humans do cooperatively runs through money. The only place where I get a little like, am I bending the mission? Is there mission creep here? Is because Bitcoin is the one un, unassailable, immutable time chain. Mm-hmm. Should we be complaining when people are trying to build additional um, anchors to that time chain? So for me, I'm a DNS guy. Mm-hmm. I want domain names on Bitcoin. I don't sure. know how they're going to happen yet. We see things like Stacks, which is a side chain. And I actually have, you know, I, I have hopes for them, mm-hmm. even though mm-hmm. like a lot of Bitcoiners probably call them shit coiners. But it's like, you know what? They're side chaining, they're pinning to Bitcoin, they're trying to do DNS on Bitcoin in an oblique way. Okay. Um, you know, I still, that's my white whale. I want DNS on Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, well, I'm not technically sophisticated enough to engage deeply in this discussion, but the way I look at it is all demand for block space is demand, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's a permissionless system. Who am I to tell you what you can do with it or what you are to do with it? Yeah. Um, that's, this is, it's something that's fundamental to permissionlessness. Sure. You can, you know, morally demonize it or whatever online if people are making shit coins on Bitcoin and then using that to scam people, well, by all means call them out. But I don't think you could bring, I don't think it justifies bringing legal coercion against those individuals that are building things on Bitcoin because ultimately yeah. Bitcoin's a permissionless system. So yeah. no, if you're going into the marketplace and you're deceiving people and you're stealing stuff from them, well, then that's a legal offense. But that, that again, that's like, you can't demonize the tool, right? Yeah. They always talk about, you can build a house with a hammer or you can bash a skull. It's not about the hammer. It's about who's using it per se. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's it. Oh, I was just going to say, when the whole controversy over, um, dare I say it, ordinals and inscriptions came out, Mm -hmm. the very first thing I thought was, oh, you could inscribe a name server delegation onto an ordinal. (laughs) That's just totally where my head went. A name server delegation would be a list of uh, domain names? Uh, It would be a list. So every domain name has like a list of name servers. All those name servers do is answer questions like, where does email for this domain go? Where's Mm. the website? So it's like a, a routing thing. You take the DNS out away from a domain name, that domain name disappears from the internet. So one of the key vectors of deplatform attacks is yeah. you go to the registrar or you go to the DNS provider and yeah. you pull the domain out, right? Um, a way to make uncensorable domain names would be you etch a, uh, uh, you etch a name server delegation onto an ordinal and it's on mm. the blockchain and that is never going away. The only thing I can't figure out is Sometimes you want to change your name server delegation. So how do you do that? You can pass the Satoshi from one party to another. So you have this like immutable ability to transfer that value Mm -hmm. or that set of intellectual property. But I don't know. I haven't thought it through enough. How do you actually update a name server delegation? Nobody's in this business yet. There's people thinking about it. Yeah. There's a, there's a, it's funny. I have these almost Socratic debates with Fiat Jeff, the Noster guy mm-hmm. about like how to do DNS on Bitcoin. Cause he knows I've been wanting this for a long time. And, and uh, we had a, 
we had this big debate around NIP5 on Noster. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's kind of going down the weeds. But he, he's got some ideas around it. There's a new thing that just came out that I don't want to butcher the name. It's space something. It's uh, Dave Carson from Impervious. Uh, he's got a web browser. He's done some stuff on the handshake. But this is built right on Bitcoin. They just started launching this. Mm. Uh, I could send you the thing if you want it for the show notes later. But So it's happening. It's yeah. starting to happen. There's a few different uh, competing things at it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's inevitable. I right. mean, the first shit coin, or if you want to call it, or the first fork was name coin. Sure. Like people sure. say, like, okay, this is perfect for this sort of yeah. uncensorable domain name use case. But I don't mean to like bring this whole thing down into yeah. the gaming yeah, sector. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. It's, um, it's worth mentioning, though, that Bitcoin, as much as we talk about Bitcoin is money, it also seems to have a lot of these other ancillary use cases that aren't com- entirely vetted or they don't exist yet, right? Like this yeah. stuff doesn't, But in theory, um, it could be used as a immutable registration service or certification yeah. service or, you know, things of this sort. And that's interesting to think about because yeah. then that's additional demand for Bitcoin that's not just the bond market or the gold market, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and this is something Jason Lowry hammers on a lot. It's like, okay, Bitcoin is money, but it's also more than money, right? Yeah. So he's, he's calling it bit power and things like this. It's um, like, where can I just peg a piece of information that I know is going to be there forever? That's right. It can't be yeah. changed. Digital permanence, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting to think about too, because theoretically, right? If you if we do figure out a way to put record keeping on the Bitcoin time chain in a way that's permanent, well, then all of a sudden history becomes a, a lot more permanent and mm-hmm. maybe a lot more accurate. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't know. It's 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 strange to think about, but you know, there's that old saying that history is written by the winners. Well, if we do get this immutable record keeping system built on top of Bitcoin then that rewriting process might not be so, um, might not take place, basically. All of this stuff you're hearing lately about AI deep fakes, mm-hmm. like whenever I see a news story like that, I say, you know, to my wife or my kid or whatever, I say, the only solution to this is there's gonna, they're gonna have to take a page from the Bitcoin playbook, mm-hmm. but it's gonna have to be at a frame by frame level. Somehow you're gonna have to cryptographically sign every single frame of a mm-hmm. live stream, mm-hmm. right? The technology is coming for that. I mean, it almost yeah. already exists and just every single frame is gonna have to be cryptographically verified against a time chain. Right. So you know that, yeah, that really is Nancy Pelosi saying, you know, right. buy Google options right. or something like that. Almost like a so. digital sig- as a digital yeah. signature, basically, yeah. or a digital yeah. fingerprint, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores. They are difficult to prepare. And even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. Fascinating to think about. Why the name Bomb Thrower? That's a pretty aggressive name. Where does that come from? Uh, well, I, you know, in another life I played in punk rock and heavy metal Mm bands, so I've always kind of had it in my blood, so to speak. And I wanted to relaunch my blog, um, as something contrarian Mm -hmm. and I'm a domain name guy and I wanted to buy like a different domain name that was like $12,000 and Mm. not as good. It was was heterodox.com. It's Mm -hmm. like, okay, I want to buy heterodox.com and and then I was, it was like $12,000. It's a lot for that name. And then I was flipping around the same aftermarket marketplace. And mm-hmm. suddenly I saw bombthrower.com 
for 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I just, okay, that's a steal. I'm buying that (laughs) name right now. At the time, I was like, I might even just keep it for my next band, which never really happened. But then when I wanted to renew or, you know, rebrand the blog, I said, you know what? I'm going Bomb Thrower. Bomb Thrower, okay. You know, I I love Zero Hedge and I just thought, um, you know, and some of my stuff goes on Zero Hedge on a fairly regular basis. And I thought, you know, it's got that same Zero Hedge. Bomb thrower. Okay. Yeah. Love the name. And it turns people's heads. Yeah. And that's. It's definitely attention grabbing. Yeah. It has that sort of rage against the machine kind of vibe. So yeah. I can see where you would like that. <laughs> okay. You speaking of, I don't know, was this published in Zero Hedge or not? The piece you wrote, the transition overview, building companies that matter. Yeah, I think it was, but it was such a long time ago. It's like off in the archives. Yeah. You got to be premium, but I did the renew, like I did a tweet thread on it just a few, like a couple weeks ago, because mm-hmm. I just thought, um, you know, the last couple Bitcoin cycles have borne this out yeah. even more than when I wrote it at the time, which was like 2017. So what, like that. what was the, your purpose of writing this particular piece and what is it about? Yeah. So I was writing, there was this movement, and I think it's a North American movement, not just a Canadian movement. It was around the aughts, like around, you know, the early 2000s. It was called the Transition Town Movement. Okay. And they said it was it was basically proto-decentralization at the township level, at the mm-hmm. municipal level. These were towns that were worried about things like economic instability, peak oil at mm-hmm. the time. That was a big meme mm-hmm. in the early, you know, 2000s. Uh and, and just, they thought we want to, you know, fragile supply chains. We want to build more resilient communities mm-hmm. so that uh, we can withstand these systemic shocks when mm-hmm. they come. Um, there's one outside of Toronto, Dundas, Ontario was one. Guelph, Ontario was one. I think Peterborough, Ontario. And in the States, uh, I'm afraid I can't remember any of the names. And so I looked at that and I thought, you know, a company is a similar, at least my company was kind of a community as well. You know, some of the people have been with it through the beginning. I want to, I can't just pull up stakes and move to Dundas. Uh, well, I guess I could, but I didn't. And I didn't think it was an option, but I thought I can, I can re-gear my company or just maybe more clearly articulate what my company is doing that's different from the herd that makes us more resilient more able to weather these systemic shocks, mm-hmm. able to to stand the test of time. Um, and so I wrote this thing called the transition overview, mm-hmm. right? So let's build companies that matter. And when I broke it down to that tweet thread last week or whatever, what I realized I was saying at the time, and I didn't really have the lingo the way I do now is, let's build low time preference companies instead of high time mm-hmm. time preference companies. Um, let's build a company that, uh, I don't think my daughter is ever going to take over easy DNS, but I, you know, I would like it if her, her and her kids can, Uh you know, live off the shares, uh, uh, for future generations. Let's build a multi-generational company. That's going to be around a while. And, uh, how do you do that in this age of peak fiat, Uh peak financialization, you know, mm-hmm. clown world, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, high time preference companies. Mm. So, so interesting. So this is pre Bitcoin for you. Well, well no. actually, no, I was this already is, in Bitcoin okay. when I wrote that, but I didn't, but you didn't know that you were talking about high time preference versus low time, the time preference companies no. until yeah. retrospect. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, and I, and I made references to Bitcoin in the, in the transition overview, but I hadn't, fully immersed myself yeah. into the philosophy the way I did. Like it really was when the lockdowns hit. Yeah. Like I was stacking Bitcoin for seven years by then, yeah. seven, eight years. Mm-hmm. But then when the lockdowns hit and I had to do something to stay sane and I started the Bitcoin capitalist and bomb for our media, that's when I really went down this. The rabbit hole. The rabbit hole. Yeah. Although I was already in the rabbit yeah. hole, but it's like, okay, now I really get it. Yeah. Now I really get it. Yeah. I, I, I saw something that maybe uh, applied to me, uh, appealed to me on an intuitive level mm-hmm. until then. And that's all I was really concerned with. It's like, I, I don't know why this thing is going to work. Mm-hmm. Like I told you in the mid nineties, I just got hit by a bolt of lightning called the Mm -hmm. internet. 
and mm-hmm. I knew it was going to change everything. Yeah. And then since then, I've seen a million things come and go that were supposed to be the next big thing. Mm-hmm. No, eh, yeah, yeah, maybe until I saw Bitcoin. Mm. And when I saw Bitcoin, it was that lightning strikes twice, mm. right? Ah, here it is again. Mm. This is the next big thing. Mm. This is going to change everything. So you would put the two on par then, Bitcoin oh, and yeah. the internet. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, and I, I, I could gauge the reaction between the two because in the mid nineties, I was broke. You know, I was mm. on the tail end of, mm. you know, being a, a bohemian musician. <laughs> and I remember just kind of pounding the pavement in downtown Toronto, just thinking, how do I get in? How do I get in? How do I get into the internet? I've got mm. no money. Mm. I don't know anything. I've got mm. no connections. Uh, and then when the internet, or when I saw Bitcoin, fortunately, I was in a different position mm-hmm. in life. Then I had a successful business, and I, you know, had some connections and tech, like a Rolodex and stuff. And it was like, okay, how do I get into this? Mm-hmm. And that was a much shorter, you know, runway. Because, yeah. like I said, suddenly I was like sponsoring. Let's talk Bitcoin, and just as the the no brainer here is, we just take Bitcoin as a payment method. Hmm. We did the same with eGold. Yeah. Right. It's like we just run the same playbook. And with eGold, we like redeemed it all the way out to physical gold, which is still on our balance sheet to this day. Wow. And uh, I said, this is the same playbook. We're going to do the same thing with Bitcoin. Nice. We're just going to take Bitcoin as a payment and stack it. Nice. Well, that's a good, good way to accumulate. Over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, But it wasn't until I started working with the biohacker Anthony DiClemente last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. So, all right, you wrote this piece, uh, again, titles Transition Overview, Building Companies That Matter, which translation, building companies that are lower time preference, yeah. more sustainable, more value focused, less fiat, maybe. Yeah. What, in the early in the piece, you talked about, I guess you were analogizing peak debt to peak oil. Yeah. People that might not be familiar with that term, peak oil, maybe you could <laughs> explain what that is and then how you analogize that to peak debt and how that it relates to the piece yeah it's incredible that it, i'm gonna have to explain this term because yeah. in the early aughts like peak oil was, was like, the big fear it was the big fear yeah. it was it was, it was it more was, malthusian bullshit by the way yeah you say it, so yeah um and i bought it at the time i'm not i can say this with retro or with yeah. hindsight but at the time i was concerned too yeah it was existential yeah. right at the time um, and now oil is just evil, right? I mean, that, I'm, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying that's the prevailing mm-hmm. orthodoxy now. It's amazing how much it's changed. So I just took it as an analogy. I said, okay, this is what the transition towns were looking at mm-hmm. and, and thinking like this can't go on forever. So how do we mitigate against it? I looked at it and I said, okay, what's our peak oil? Our peak oil being in this business, being a dot-com, our, our um, peak oil is peak debt. Is mm-hmm. what I thought. I thought that, and I was writing about these. Things. Sorry, sorry, people still might not know what peak oil is, though. Could you just explain? Oh, that? sorry, yeah. yeah. So peak oil. Um, there was a guy named Hubbard, mm-hmm. Professor Hubbard, 
so it was originally called Hubbard's Peak, who calculated that at some point in time, there's a fee, there's a finite amount of oil in the world. Mm-hmm. And at some point in time, uh, oil production would hit its maximum, mm-hmm. right? It's 50% maximum. And for the rest of time after that, mm-hmm. it, we would have declining oil production, yeah. uh, which would drive the price of oil into the stratosphere. And I think yeah. he said the final 20% of oil would be unrecoverable at any cost, mm-hmm. right? And he said the United States would hit Hubbard's peak. I think mm-hmm. he predicted the 70s. I mm-hmm. could have the years completely mm-hmm. off. And then he said the world was going to hit it in like 2012 or mm-hmm. something like that. And so there is this, this dread that we were going to run out of oil. Yeah. And the price of oil was going to go into the stratosphere and countries were going to go to war over these yeah. declining oil pools. And that was the peak oil Yes. You know, existential threat. So I looked at, well, what's the existential threat to the dot-com business, to Mm -hmm. the internet, to just being a company out here in this environment? And I said, it was peak debt. Mm -hmm. Peak debt is the same as peak oil. Not that we were running out of debt, precisely the opposite, I guess. So maybe a clumsy analogy in retrospect, just debt was going up and up and up and up and Mm -hmm. it was devaluing Mm -hmm. money. And, um, I didn't know what the Cantillon effect was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there was a term for it. Mm -hmm. Actually, until just a few years ago, Mm. I was writing an article and someone said in the comments, oh yeah, that's Cantillon effect. I'm like, mind blown. (laughs) But- And what what is that for the audience, please? So the Cantillon effect, Richard Cantillon, what was it, 1650, I think? a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, French wrote one of the first economic treaties ever um, saying that when money is introduced, because I don't think it is even fiat at that point in time, but it, but he said when it was, when new money is introduced into the system, the people closest to the origin point of the money benefit from it and the yes. people furthest from the, the ingress point of yeah. this new money yeah. um, are impoverished by it, Yes, right? So now we have the fiat world. You can create money out of thin air at the central bank. So the people around the central bankers mm-hmm right? The investment banks, the private equity, the, you know, the whales of fiat Mm -hmm. world, they experience new money issuance as rising asset values. It makes them richer and everybody else, the further away you are from that monetary spigot, it drives your cost of living up. It costs you more money to stay alive. It makes you more impoverished. Right. So that's Cantillon effect. This is the rich stealing from the poor, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just basically by like slicing a piece of pizza into many more slices. Yeah. Well, actually, no, it's an infinite pizza. But well, you are slicing the pizza into more slices, but you're not you're not giving the slices out pro rata, right? Yeah. They all the new slices go to one group. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. they get to, yeah, yeah. So basically, it dilutes everyone else. Yeah. So in retrospect, it was a clumsy analogy that I only recognized intuitively as peak debt, but mm-hmm. I just knew that money was becoming worth less and less. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I knew what it was doing to the industry. And what it yeah. was doing to the industry was, you know, in the early days of Easy DNS, people were saying to us, you're never going to compete against network solutions, mm-hmm. which was the 800 pound gorilla mm-hmm. at the time. What are you even charging for this for? You've got to give it away for free. Mm-hmm. You've got to get as many users as you can, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, well, how do we pay the bills that way? Yeah. Oh, you get VC. Yeah. So you got to do a VC round. Mm-hmm. You got to raise funding. You you get as much customers as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, when you run out of money, if you're getting enough customers, you can get more money. Mm-hmm. You can get an up round. And you keep doing that until Network Solutions buys you. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I want to just run a business that's like paying the bills. And it's like, you're never going to make it. <clears throat> we did make it. And so I'm like, well, what's happening here? Because everybody else in the industry or a lot of people in the industry were going the other route. Mm-hmm. They're like, okay, we got to do the VC. We've got to grow mm-hmm. as fast as we can. And, you know, one of the stories I tell in the tweet thread is, um, you know, I'm driving down the highway in Toronto and I'm seeing billboards for my largest competitor, which is based out of, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And I see their, I see their billboards all over Toronto and in the bus shelters and they have Super Bowl ads and they're selling, you know, they're undercutting our prices. And it's like, 
I look at the S1 because they had filed to go public. It's like they're losing $350 million a year. They have no retained earnings, right? And it's like, that's the whole, that's the whole model that you're competing mm-hmm. against. You're competing against companies that don't have to be profitable. Mm. And um, there's a guy, uh, a Silicon Valley um, you know, pioneer or veteran. He was a journalist named Bob Cringely. Mm who was an easy DNS customer. So I knew him from that. And he, we got on the phone once and he told me the story about, um, we were talking about this dynamic and he wrote actually the exit trap that's linked in the tweet thread talking about how, you know, businesses want to exit before you even know how you get in. Mm -hmm. Right. And he says that the lasting businesses, if you look at them, you'll notice they don't have an exit plan. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't, does Jeff Bezos want to exit? Like, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyhow, he told me the story about this. Did you ever watch Star Trek, the original, when you were a kid? Um, I've seen a few of them, but not a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. aging myself here. <laughs> In the original series, there was an episode called like the Altarian Suicide Mission, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the Enterprise crew are out there in space, and they come across this other warship. It's faster than them. It can outgun them. It's just they're totally like... On they're outnumbered, outmaneuvered, outclassed on yeah. every dimensional yeah. aspect. They're like, how is this even possible? Mm-hmm. And it turns out by the end of the episode that the other ship doesn't have any provisions to get back home, not even enough oxygen to get back home. Mm. They're only out there to die, right? Mm. And and Bob Cringley said to me, that's what all your competition is, <laughs> right? They're all on this suicide mission to get ingested by the nearest 800 pound gorilla mm, yeah. or blow up in a puff of goodwill when some, yeah. you know, when they go public and, and uh, uh, the loop investors hold all the, yeah. all the bags. And this is, I mean, what a perversion of traditional prudence, right? Where you run a business profitably. <laughs> that used to be our it. joke in the early yeah. days. We used to say we do business the old fashioned way at a profit. At a profit. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, you know, this incentive to get big enough to get acquired or the real holy grail, get too big to fail. Yeah. Right. If yeah. you get you so get big yeah. that the government will just never let you fail. They'll, yeah. they'll just steal from people by printing money to buy your shares or to, or to bail yeah. you out. Um, it, it just, it's a testament to how screwed up fiat incentives are, right? It's yeah. literally an inversion of economics, even yeah. at its core, right? The core of economics is you must produce to consume. You cannot consume what has not been produced. And the core of Keynesian economics is every time there is an economic contraction, well, we need to stimulate consumption. Yeah. It's not that we need to yeah. do anything about production. We just need people to consume more and yeah. that'll fix things. Obviously it's, it's like eating the seed corn, right? And you see that the consequences of that mentality all the way up the stack, including what you're describing here. And it's why Bitcoin made so much sense to me yeah. as a movement of like, this is the way it should be. It mm-hmm. goes beyond being sound money mm-hmm. because what you were saying, you have to produce before you can consume. Well, you have to, that's why proof of work is yes, so important, of right? You yeah. have to do this economic trade-off of energy for yes. proof of work. And if there is no uh, rational basis for doing so, then economic actors aren't going to do it. That's right. And it's why the hash rate is up only. Yeah. No matter what the price is doing, right? The hash rate never, like, I mean, it has those perturbations. Like sure. China did the ban and that sort of thing, yeah. but it just... It's production before consumption. That's right. Right. And That's it's right. It's just okay. It was like when Bitcoin came along. It was like I'm home. Yeah. Right? This is this is <laughs> finally you know something is happening. And I've never been like immersed in the business, like doing Bitcoin startups yeah. and stuff like that. I've always been sort of peripheral to it. And then mm. the newsletter, of course. But it just felt really like yeah, this is like. There's an intuitive resonance economics, for yeah. a lot of people, right? It's yeah. like, oh, of course that makes sense. If money is the thing we use to acquire goods or and services, and goods and services take work to produce, doesn't it intuitively make sense that the work should also take work to produce? Yeah. And isn't just printed out of thin air? I mean, you know, you get that. Like a child will understand this if you really explain it to them. And isn't it amazing, and this is what Keynesians can't wrap their heads around, 
So I do some work and I produce something of value, something that somebody else wants to trade to me in exchange for their money, their Bitcoin. And over time, the money that I earn from deriving value or producing value, providing value, gains purchasing power over time mm. or purchasing power over time. Mm. How crazy is that? Yeah. You know, instead yeah. of what I call the treadmill economy, I'm yeah. going to pay you in this fiat money that I'm going to counterfeit out of thin air. Mm -hmm. And every day it's going to be worth less money and yeah. you're going to have to spend more of it. We'll talk, talk about that when we get to CBDCs probably yeah. um, just to stay in one spot. Thanks to my friends at Swan Bitcoin for supporting the show. Swan sponsored the Sailor Series, and I appreciate their support from the very beginning of the What Is Money show, and I'm happy to welcome them back. Swan has grown a lot since then. They've built a full-service Bitcoin-centric financial services company with several different offerings. With the Swan app, you can set up instant and recurring Bitcoin buys. And with this, you can get started at swan.com slash breedlove. Swan also enables clients in the U.S. to hold Bitcoin directly in an IRA account, so you can hold Bitcoin in a tax-advantaged way. Get started at swan.com slash IRA. If you're looking to buy more than $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, check out Swan Private. You'll get concierge support for buy execution, retirement accounts, inheritance and estate planning, and access to exclusive events, research, and other content. Get started at swan.com slash private. Swan Institutional provides financial services to institutions, including Bitcoin-backed lending, asset management, principal investments, Bitcoin services for financial advisors, and Bitcoin mining operations. For those new to Bitcoin, I recommend checking out Swan's Welcome to Bitcoin course at swan.com slash welcome. So go to swan.com slash breed love today to get started on your bitcoin buying journey it's absolutely ridiculous and they even use very fancy euphemisms to cover this up right as yeah. you said if the purchasing power of your money goes up over time well that would mean your savings are more valuable over time that's an obviously obviously a good thing for the saver right yeah Yet, what's the term they use in Keynesian economics to describe that? Is excess, deflation? Yeah, yeah, deflation. deflation or excess savings or so. Yeah, prices like are going down. Yeah. There's a deflationary collapse. I can't tell you how many arguments I've had on Twitter with people saying like, "Oh, Bitcoin is fixed supply currency, therefore it's going to cause hyper deflationary collapse." Just like I read in my Keynesian economics textbook, I'm like, "Have you ever just stopped and like for one second think critically what a price is? A price is telling you." how much time and energy is necessary to solve a particular problem. Yeah. So if the time and energy to solve a particular problem is going down over time, don't you think that is a good thing for you? That yeah. it actually increases your ability to solve problems? But this, this indoctrination that's taken place over the past 100 some odd years is very effective and people are brainwashed. Have effectively. you ever read George Gilder's books? I have read, um, I have, uh, Part of Knowledge and Power. And he, had a, he wrote a really good monogram actually comparing money and time describing gold as like a clock. And I thought that was very useful. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, you know, now all of the, now that I brought it up, all the titles of his books are eluding me, but the latest one, right. Is um, life after capitalism. Yeah. I think yep. and it's, it's a brilliant book and I love all of his books. And he came up with the term of the system we're living in today as emergency socialism. I just yes. love that phrase. Yep. And is a reading a great book. He did life, life after capitalism, life after TV, life after Google. Uh, Google. Yeah, great books. Super brilliant guy. Yeah. You're reading life after capitalism. You get to chapter thirteen, Bitcoin capitalism. I'm like, whoa, mind blown. Bitcoin yeah. capitalism. And then he says, unfortunately, Bitcoin can't actually get the job done because it's got the uh, the limited supply. So something better than Bitcoin yeah. will come along to replace it. And it was just. The moment oh, where the heart breaks yeah. and it was like, oh, yeah. George, yeah, he say wrote, it isn't show. So. He wrote, I can't think of the title of the piece, but it's a brilliant piece describing how gold has functioned as like it's this clock. The, the Scandal of Money, I believe, is the book. Um, the piece I'm thinking of is not that because it's just, it's not even a book. It's just oh, a, okay. mon a monogram that's online. Yeah. Anyways, I'll, I'll find it and put it in the show notes. But same conclusion, sort of. Yeah. He gets to Bitcoin and he's like, he, he's not that strong in his... Um, 
judgment. And he says, maybe it could work, but I think gold is better. But yeah. anyways, brilliant yeah. guy. It was, it was a heartbreaker. But Let me ask you about this. So you, in your piece, again, the transition overview, you're talking about building companies that matter. You say that we are in a global debt super cycle. Can you tell us what that is? And what inning are we in in the global debt super cycle? Yeah, I guess at the time I didn't fully understand what I meant. I just thought, you know, the debt's going up, the debt, is, like yeah. the, the deficits are going up, the debt is going up. Like every, you know, like anyone who's sort of a contrarian economics mm-hmm. buff, you kind of know the graphs. What I realize now in retrospect, I was talking about the bond bubble, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So the cost of capital was coming down for 40 years, mm-hmm. right? That was the, the debt super cycle. Yeah. Just the cost of capital is constantly coming down, coming down, coming down, which was cheapening the money. Right? Yeah. As the money, you print more of it, yeah. it becomes cheap effectively. Yeah. You're saying you know, artificially suppressed interest rates. Correct. Yeah. Right. So that was the debt super cycle. And then, you know, we just are coming out of the fastest interest rate hike cycle on record, I mm-hmm. think. Although mm-hmm. uh, someone told me, uh, I was at lunch a um, couple of days ago and he mentioned that in Canada in the early 90s, the real estate crash there was because we raised 300 basis points in 30 days. Mm-hmm. I don't remember that. But mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. anyway, so we're on the the fastest debt hiking cycle ever. It kind of popped the everything bubble, or at least it looked like it. So secular crash in cost of capital going on for 40 years, 1982, mm-hmm. I guess, mm-hmm. coinciding with the stock, you know, the stock market super mm-hmm. cycle. So what inning are we in now? I don't know. I mean, to use the baseball, th- like, is there overtime in baseball? I don't <laughs> there follow There can be it. extra innings. Yeah, yes. well, that's where we are. Yeah. We're in extra innings okay. now. Yeah. And I think um, COVID was what sent us into extra innings. Yeah. And uh, like, I'm not, we can talk about conspiracy and all that if you want. I'm not, I'm generally not conspiratorial minded. Mm. I'm perverse incentives minded, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And clown world minded. But, Mm. um, you know, Daniel DiMartino Booth said Mm. a few times, and I took notice when she said it, she said, you know, the central bankers really needed something like COVID to hit when it hit of course because we had that reverse repo problem yeah. in like late 19 like yeah. 2019 the system really was coming unglued under yeah. the hood um it was looking bad and then thank god covid's here and then yeah. the bazookas came out and the yeah. qe you know the money printers went and so that sent us into extra innings yeah and now we're in i don't know extra yeah. extra innings <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so the, all a consequence of the central planning of money, though, yeah. right? Again, this is the interest rate basically means the rate at which investors are interested in having their capital now rather than later, right? How much you're going to pay to separate a capitalist from his capital, also typically considered to be the price of money. Yep. And as it turns out, when you artificially suppress, or I'm sorry, when you artificially produce excess money, you can artificially suppress the interest rate effectively. Yeah. And that has been what's happening for a very long time. And this creates all kinds of distortions in the marketplace. Um, what, how then does this relate to this global debt super cycle, which we're in the extra innings for? How does this relate to the debt growth model? You talk about the piece in the piece, uh, which is a playbook many of these companies are subscribing to. And why do you think the debt growth model is over? Yeah. So the debt growth model in those days was, you know, just racking up cheaper and cheaper debt, but more and more of it to, mm-hmm. to grow your company mm-hmm. and do acquisitions. But what a lot of companies did, they wouldn't even do acquisitions. They do buybacks, mm-hmm. they do share buybacks. And that was one of the inversions I talked about in the, the transition overview was you would have companies levering up on debt to buy back their own shares, which are trading at all time highs, Mm -hmm. which the value investor in me seems kind of backwards. I mean, if your share price is trading in the toilet and you you're the company and you think that you're undervalued and you have money in the bank, you can use that money to buy your shares. That's a prudent way Mm -hmm. to buy back your shares. But, you know, levering up 
to like GE did that for I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but they vaporized like forty billion dollars in yeah. six months just yeah. <laughs> to buy yeah. back their own shares that were then below the value that they bought them at. Yeah, and to the perverse incentives point you made earlier, a lot of these executive compensation packages are based on earnings per share. Yeah. So if they were they buy shares out of the marketplace, put them, yeah. uh, take them on as treasury shares. That reduces the denominator yep. in that calculation, which bonuses increases their bonuses. Exactly. Which are issued in options most of the time, yes. which then is like his fiat for company shares, right? Yes. So you sort of like, yes. I'm going to materialize these options out of the Black Shoals vortex. Right. And I'm going to, and, and now they're, they sort of come into existence already in the strike zone. So now I'm going to just exercise these options. Exactly. And uh, you've, diluted all your other shareholders, but yes. you got your bonus. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but when you have artificially cheap money, and again, yeah. that proximity to the money printer, yeah. that's what distorts the calculus on the whole thing, yep. right? And you get companies just hand over fist. I think you said some crazy number, like three quarters. When so, I wrote it, yeah. like I went and looked at the numbers and I can't, I don't, I think it was like 71% yeah, of the previous yeah. like, two or three years of earnings yeah. in the S&P were yeah. all, all to buybacks. share buybacks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was crazy. Yeah. And this again is a fiat problem because, yeah. well, companies that would normally keep those earnings, that would, would retain those earnings in some store of value. Well, when you don't have a store of value, what do you do? You just buy back your own shares yeah. and you compound that with the agency problem that we mentioned with EPS uh, targets and bonus calculations and, you get really nasty um, consequences, right? You end up in this situation where the Fed has to print money to keep the stock market going. Not basically. just the stock market, yeah. everything. Yes. Right? I mean, you said earlier, like deflate, you know, the Keynesians think deflation is death. Yeah. Deflation is death when you're using debt for money. That's right. Right? Yeah. You can't. And I remember figuring this out, like, when I was reading, you know, when I was a gold bug reading Ferdinand Lipp's Gold Wars. Oh, I yeah, great book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember writing on the inside cover, realizing it, that this fiat money allows a dollar to exist in two places at once. Yeah. Right? And then the worst thing that can possibly happen is someone li liquidates their debt. Yeah. Either by um, default or paying it back. Yeah. You're kind of rugging. Yeah. Every other dollar that's sort of fractionalized from it. That's right. And so the worst possible thing that can happen is the debt pie shrinks yeah. because then it's it's like serial cascades of like rehypothecated debt just eating its own tail. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if the purchasing power of money goes up over time, as it tends to with sound money, then debt doesn't make as much sense because you would be borrowing dollars today that get stronger over time. You got to really think through your debt. Right. It needs to seriously pay. And therefore, debt tends to be a much smaller component of the overall economy. Yeah. Whereas, again, the fiat world is the exact opposite, right? You borrow dollars today that are stronger and are expected to get weaker over time. Therefore, they are easier to pay back. Therefore, people get into debt up to their eyeballs. You think through everything to that can, to that level when you're using sound money. Yeah. Not just debt. That's like, right. What am I going to spend this on? That's right. Am I going to just blow this on something that's ephemeral and going to be gone in, yeah. in three seconds? Or am I going to put this into something that's going to give me value over time? Yes, right? that's right. Are you sick of being robbed by politicians through inflation and endless money printing? If so, you need to be at Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee on July 25th through 27th. As the largest Bitcoin and fintech conference in the world, Bitcoin 2024 stands as a beacon of monetary freedom, a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Top speakers, companies, and thought leaders from across the industry will convene in Nashville to look ahead to the next year and beyond. I will be there, and Bitcoin conferences like this have become my favorite place to socialize since becoming a Bitcoiner. Ticket prices will increase soon. Get your tickets now and secure your spot at this game-changing event. So go to b.tc slash conference and use discount code BREEDLOVE to sign up for the Bitcoin 2024 conference 
Again, that's b.tc slash conference discount code breedlove. Yeah, it's a real barometer for opportunity cost. Yeah. And if the, your purchasing power goes up over time, you're going to think twice about getting that 80 inch, you know, high def big screen TV. Yeah. You know, like maybe I'll wait. If I wait till next year, it's 3% cheaper. Or the year after that, it's 6% cheaper. Yeah. And it'll take me less sound money to buy it. That's right. 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 And so more deferred consumption, more investment, more productivity, more wealth creation. Yeah. It's like almost like deflation, which is this Keynesian euphemism that sounds terrible and scary. Deflation is economization. It's the point of the economy. You yeah. want prices to deflate, right? If we all pick apples by hand, well, then apples are going to be a certain price. If we buy an apple picking machine, they're going to be a lot cheaper yeah. and we're all going to benefit. And so Keynesian economics has literally just flipped the whole thing on its head. It's terrible. You know, you just made me realize like maybe, maybe I've said it before, but not really put it together like this, this whole net zero degrowth Mm -hmm. movement out there. It's like, oh, we're running out of resources. We're yeah. destroying the climate. Uh, we've got to like ratchet down our, our standard of living mm -hmm. is basically the upshot of that argument. If that whole, let, let's concede, I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's true, but let's concede for the moment that let's say consumption is higher than the, the earth can carry, mm -hmm. which I don't think it is. Yeah. But let's say, let's stipulate that that's a byproduct of fiat money, mm -hmm. right? Because the money is so cheap, right? The, the denominator is sort of disintegrating. And so like, it just, I got to spend this yeah. on what? I don't care. Like just place a bet, buy this, blow this, yeah. whatever, or buy a pair of jeans that I'll wear twice and throw them that's out. Right. And I don't care. Whereas mm -hmm. in a sound money world where everyone's putting this yes. extra sort of uh, low time preference yes. into both their borrowing decisions yeah. and their consumption decisions. And you're still going to have consumption, sure. but you would probably see a lot less waste. That's right. It's, if you have the central planning of money, it's one step removed maybe from social engineering. So yeah. what you're describing here with CBDCs today, we don't like you eating so much red meat tomorrow. We don't like the tweet you put out. Yeah. Then eventually we don't, who knows like the, the memes online are hilarious, right? Uh, it's year 2030. Are you hiding street people under your porch? You know, like, <laughs> like who knows where it goes? It's just bananas. Um, but yeah. the point is that to take it all the way back is like, if money is this tool of pure options, the further we move along the centralization curve, the more your options are taken away basically. Yeah. Right. The funny thing was during, during the seven days of martial law in Canada, and I'm thinking, okay, so, if our if my corporate bank accounts are frozen, mm -hmm. how long can I run the company on our Bitcoin? Mm, <laughs> because right. one hundred percent of Easy DNS's retained earnings are in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They were. It's like okay, all right. So I'm gonna have to. How many payrolls can I make right. with Bitcoin? Right. right? Um, so out of all of that, it's like, yeah, so the only thing I can really bank on, no pun intended, right, Bitcoin. is my Bitcoin. That's right. Yeah. And that's why Bitcoin is the best bank ever built. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you said, uh, when we were offline, you said you learned a lesson from your mom, actually. Right. So yeah. your mom grew up in Germany. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what decade, but you were saying that this whole equality of outcome yeah. BS, she saw how that unraveled in real time. Could you tell us that story? Sure. Yeah. I mean, my mom was born in 1930 in Germany. Mm -hmm. She was nine when Hitler came to power, although he was rising before then. Mm -hmm. um, and she's lots of interesting stories. She also had a grandfather who lost everything in the hyperinflation mm -hmm. in the Weimar Republic too. There's a different story about him, but, uh, we were talking about equality of outcome mm -hmm. when I still lived at home. And uh, she said, you know, I've seen that attempted because after the war, Germany was one big equality of outcome. Mm -hmm. It was bombed out and yeah. everybody who was still alive lost everything. Yeah. So we were all penniless and we were all poor. And my mom came from a pretty affluent family before mm -hmm. the war. Just took one bad government to take it all away, right? Generations worth. 
And so she said, we all started with nothing. We were all broke. And then the allies had this new system at the time, like right after the war, where she said, you know, everyone got like whatever, the same amount. Mm -hmm. Every family got the same amount. So this is more like equality of opportunity in a way. Everyone got the same starting point. I guess. Yeah. And that they were going to get the same amount like every month. Yeah. Right. So it's like, okay, if if anything is equality of outcome, like yeah. or at least you're starting there. Yeah. And she said, you know, Mark, within a year, mm-hmm. right, there were rich people, there were poor people. Mm. They all started from the same place. Hmm. Right. Everybody like that just doesn't work. This right. whole equality of outcome right. or right. whatever, you know, earlier utterings of universal basic income or yeah. whatever. It's like, it doesn't, it, I've seen it. That's yeah. what she's used to say. You know, I've seen it. It doesn't work. And it takes, sure. you know, under a couple of years. Yeah. No, it's an excellent point. We, yeah. Equality of outcome, obviously BS. We're all born different. Uh, I'm sorry. Outcome would be like the end game, right? So. The only place we're all equal is in the grave, right? But yeah. between here and the grave, we're all sorts of different things, right? We're yeah. taller, shorter, smarter, dumber. Like we're just different. Quality of opportunity also BS because we're born in different places, different times, different circumstances. Yeah. You can't, I mean, that's the closest thing to a controlled experiment I guess you could have. But the only form of equality that we actually want is uh, equality in the eyes of the law, right? We just want yeah. fair and equal rules to play by. Yeah. And that would be what Bitcoin is. All humans are actually equal in the eyes of Bitcoin. And that would be what monetary apartheid or central bank digital currencies or fiat currency are not, right? Yeah. There's a group of insiders that benefit at the expense of outsiders. Yeah. Especially because in a CBDC system, like I said, they're going to launch as or morph into social credit. Yeah. And, you know, social credit by definition is the opposite of a quality of outcome. Exactly. Right. It's like yeah. you did something afoul of the rules. So your outcomes are about to be attenuated. That's right. Um, and uh, this other person maybe is a central party member. So mm-hmm. they, they get a few extra perks here and there. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the opposite of a quality of outcome. So no matter how you try to slice it, equality of outcome is, is, is a nonsensical concept. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And we, we, yeah, we need more people understanding that because it's a very romantic notion. Yeah. You Actually, know, I, I don't find it romantic at all. Well, like you well, want everybody to be the same. You want us to all, all be I clones? guess it's easy to sell to people that are disadvantaged, right? Someone yeah. that's disadvantaged in whatever way. I don't like pick your pick your domain of, of disadvantage, but you can sell that to someone that dis, that's disadvantaged saying, you know what? When I say they, like a politician can sell that to someone that's disadvantaged saying, we're going to make everyone equal. And on the surface, that might sound good. If like, oh, I'm in the lower half and you're going to make us all equal. Well, great. I, but if you stop and think critically about it, you'll quickly see that it's utter bullshit. I wish I didn't go bald later in life. Like, <laughs> why don't I get some of your hair and Nick's hair and we can all be a quality of outcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like more philosophically, it's all the variety and uncertainty that gives life its sweetness. Yeah. And so if we made everything purely uniform, like that's just, it's a nightmare, right? It, this might seem oblique reference to this, but it brings me back to like the domain days and during the dot-com boom mm-hmm. when like the right dictionary word with the string dot-com on the end of yeah. it could sell for millions of sure. dollars. And yeah. people were like, oh, this is a category killing domain name, yeah. business.com. And like, yeah. why? None of the successful brands are named the generic name of their brand.com, right? right? It's not search.com, it's Google. It's like the successful brands define the name. It's a Kleenex, not a facial tissue, right? Amazon, not book.com. And Mm -hmm. it's that same thing. It's like, you don't want everything to be generic, yeah, right? There's no appeal to that. That's right. Uh, You know, eating at McDonald's, it's generic. It's the same thing everywhere. Although, did you see... (laughs) This is way off topic, but it's, did you see the thing about Wendy's is in implementing surge pricing? No. So that they're going to adjust their pricing on their burgers, like based on demand and time of day and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. This morning. Uh, so if the 
line at the drive through is long, the prices will go up? Maybe. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder if we'll see more dynamic pricing schemes like that just because information's more liquid now. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No. Interesting to think about. Uh, one last thing. So you were telling me offline that you orange pilled some guys that did a re- renovation on your house. Yeah. What's the story there? Yeah. So we built a office addition onto the house. Uh, my wife is a writer. She's got a new writer writer's den. I'm going to take her old office for a podcast studio, but, uh, you know, the, the crew, great crew, um, working on it. They were like there for months. And, uh, one of them saw me walking around the zero hedge t-shirt one day. Mm-hmm. So we just got to talking. And uh, turns out all the all the trades guys on the crew, they're all stacking sats, mm. right? They're all, you know, we were joking one day about something about like, and they're like, stay humble and stack sats. <laughs> then one of the partners in the company, you know, was like, can can you pay a chunk of this reno in Bitcoin? Mm. And uh, he's like, this is not, like sometimes trades, they want to get paid under the table in yeah. cash. And so they can just, he says, this isn't that. He's like, it's going to be reflected in your invoice. Um, they were such a professional company. And uh, I want you to show me how to custody it, mm. right? I'm going to split it with my partner. And I want you to show me how to custody my portion. I want my kids to get this. Mm. And and it goes back to like, what do you value? How do you spend it? And mm-hmm. I thought, yeah, let's, I'm going to pay that part of this in Bitcoin because this is, the mission, right? Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm, orange mm-hmm. pilling, like practically a whole squad of people. Mm. And uh, yeah, I know the Bitcoin, like Bitcoin's gone up $20,000 since I did that. Or yeah. Maybe not that much, but I'm like, I'm happy for them. Yeah. You know, I saw them the other day. I said, I bet you're happy now. I said, yeah, <laughs> this is really great. I just, I just don't know how do I do this? Like after I'm gone and I'm like, okay, we'll talk about that and we'll get you set up and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, but you see that long-term thinking, yeah. right? They're thinking multi-generational um, and you know, they get it. Yeah, These guys totally get it. That's so, so cool. That's yeah. so cool. You're serving the mission, even when it doesn't necessarily serve your own self-interest. Yeah. So, so this is, yeah, it's really cool. Um, Mark, man, thank you for joining me here in the home studio. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm glad I came down. Thanks for having me. It's an, it's an honor and a privilege. So thank you. Yeah. We'll have to do it again sometime. Love uh, to. where can people find you on the internet? Um, stunt Pope on Twitter. Um, bombthrower.com is, is you can get on the mailing list there. The Bitcoin capitalist.com is, is the newsletter. And, uh, my main thing is easy DNS. So Awesome. Even, yeah, easydns.com if you want to go someplace where you're not going to be deplatformed. And we take Bitcoin. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> All right, Mark. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert.